All right, so let's get started. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dave Goldblatt. Uh, I was at Facebook from 2007 to 2017. Uh, did my own startup for a couple years after that. Uh, now I'm kind of fun employed, but uh, going to get my own rolling fund starting pretty soon. Um, just as a caveat, like the crypto ecosystem is enormous and has far reaching consequences. Um, I'll do my best with uh, to attempt to explain some of the imminent consequences, uh, specifically in how it relates to investing in uh, crypto and crypto adjacent companies and crypto protocols and tokens. Um, and also I'll touch a little bit on sort of broader macro trends. Uh, and an even broader caveat is, I don't think these things are just going to play out over the next five years, 10 years. I think it's going to be a, a 25 year thing similar to what the internet was like in 1996. Cool. So just to set context, like what even is money? Uh, so this is the, the way that I like to think about it. Humans expend energy, like chopping down a tree or doing someone else's taxes to create value, things that are useful to other human beings. Money is the technology to store that created value. Money allows you to exchange that value for other things like groceries or a Lambo at a later time and, and eventually across space. Um, the current money technology that has been in use, predominant use for the past hundred years has been currency issued by governments of nation states. Um, because, you know, the past hundred years after the industrial revolution, these were the only entities that were able to coordinate trust. In the past, you could do it just because you were in a village or uh, the Catholic Church did it, but these are the predominant entities, the predominant powers, so they have taken on the responsibility of coordinating trust between two people or two entities or multiple entities. So it's 2021, we have the internet. Isn't it time to upgrade the technology of money? We've been using the same technology for several hundred years. And like, why didn't this happen before? Like. The internet has been around for 30 plus years. Um, you know, you have an iPhone in your pocket. Um, why haven't we upgraded money before? Uh, and just to be clear, the idea of creating a, a digitally native form of money has been around way before Bitcoin existed um, with some work going back to even the 1960s or 1970s. So the reason we couldn't do this is the Byzantine generals problem. And that's, that's the genius of Bitcoin and what Bitcoin solved, uh, which is basically digitized trust, which you need to transfer value from one, one person to another. Like you no longer need a, de a centralized entity, which is, uh, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Um, you needed, and you know, I don't know if anybody has any finance experience, but you need humans in the loop to say, this is legit, this person has money, or this is not legit and this person, you know, does not have money or this is a terrorist organization or, or whatever the case may be. Um, post Bitcoin, it's completely verifiable and a consensus. So let's talk a little bit about what are the problems of centralized money? So it can be confiscated and it can be censored. Uh, you can have your assets seized or frozen. It's slow. Uh, there's, a, there's an old joke. What's the quickest way to transfer a million dollars from New York to London on uh, Friday at 5 p.m.? And the answer is get a suitcase filled with cash and hop on a plane because things are closed on the weekends. Banks are closed on the weekends. Um, it's opaque and unverifiable. How many dollars exist? Can you verify how many dollars exist? Can Joe Biden verify how many dollars exist? Um, you, you just kind of have to put your trust in the system. It's inflationary. So, you know, I'm sure you're following the news. They just printed $2 trillion worth of, worth of money, the, the US government. Um, and you see this get sort of like out of control in places like Venezuela or Nigeria. Uh, it's permission. So, you know, hey, I have an idea of how I want monetary policy to work better or a better, uh, some better rails to connect with my bank account. You can't build on top of that. You can't go to Jerome Powell, uh, chair of the Fed Reserve and be like, 
uh, excuse me, I, I think I have an idea. Um, you need to be on the inside. Um, and then finally, it's centralized. Anytime you have a small group of people making decisions that affect hundreds of millions or billions of people, there's going to be some issues. Um, I, I think we've seen just how out of touch um, you know, the IMF and the central banks are. So now that we have Bitcoin and we have this uh, decentralized piece of technology to build our own money technology, uh, what are the attributes of this new money? It can't be confiscated by the government and it can't be censored by the government. You know, hopefully most of the people here have never experienced being censored by your government, but ask someone in China if they're speaking about um, the Uyghur genocide, if the Chinese government wants to censor them and take away their money, confiscate their money. It's digitally native, so you can now transfer things at, at the speed of light. Uh, I don't know, again, if anybody's worked in finance, but it is not digitally native and the software is pretty terrible. It's divisible. So um, you can granularly send units of value down to eight decimal places. And you cannot do that with the traditional financial system. This is a huge one. It's fully transparent and verifiable. So you don't have to trust that the central bank has this money or doesn't have this money. You don't have to trust that the other person um, has verified that this person is a verified, a trustworthy source. You can download all the blockchain data and do it yourself. It's programmable. So everybody knows Andreessen Horowitz, uh, software is eating the world. This is turning money into software. And I don't think anybody needs to be told on this call, if you turn something into software, it 1,000x, 10,000x, 10,000x is the value of things. Um, finally, it's permissionless. So if you don't like Bitcoin, you don't like Ethereum uh, for whatever reason, go fork it and build your own thing or build a, build a patch on top of it. Um, or you can... Um, in certain, uh, certain cryptocurrencies, you can uh, be part of the governance of that cryptocurrency and get enough people to change the policy of that, that currency. So I'll pause there. Um, I wanna make this you know, interactive. Um, are there any pieces of this, this context setting that are maybe a little bit opaque or you want me to go over um, and I don't know uh, Richard, if you could read um, some of the things, maybe there's a question in the chat, um, post questions in the chat, and we can either get to them in context or afterwards. Anything, Richard? Yeah, so right now, I, I, I don't see any uh, in the chat, um, but as they come up, I'll, I'll definitely let you know. Sure, sounds good. Cool. So given all that context, uh, I'm, I'm going to narrow and just how broad crypto is. I'm going to narrow the scope of this to how do you evaluate investing in a, in a crypto company and then eventually protocols and tokens? So the answer is the same as a, as a regular company. So hopefully some of, or most of you have done angel investments in here or are aware of angel investing. Um, but you got to think about like, is this company actually solving a real problem? Do they have a team that has built something before and has iterated? Um, are they, um, do they have a community? Do they have uh, developers building on their, on their protocols or their ecosystems? Um, crypto is, is at a point right now where I wouldn't say this is a crypto company. Crypto is just a tool for um, solving a problem for people that um, didn't exist prior. It's kind of like saying, oh, you know, is this an internet company or a mobile company? Like, you know, it, those are just tools, platforms to, to build off of. Um, and I can pause there because there's a lot of nuance to that and things that maybe um, people might have questions on. Um, you can post them in the chat or I can come back to you later. Uh, there is one question from Yuri. Are we talking about yeah. Bitcoin in specific or all cryptocurrencies? Um, and in it, does he mean this in terms of um, 
going back to centralized versus decentralized? Like these. Uh, these perhaps slides. Yuri can um, uh, elaborate Yuri, more you on the hop question. On. And just like, uh, yeah, like uh, pretty much everything you were mentioning about new money, are you talking mm -hmm. here about Bitcoin or because different cryptocurrencies have different, you know, characteristics? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I will get to that in terms of evaluating different protocols and tokens later on. Mm -hmm. I'm setting the groundwork and apologize if this wasn't clear, uh, setting the groundwork because Bitcoin is kind of the granddaddy of it all. And it mm -hmm. eventually led everything else is... Uh, is kind of like a child of Bitcoin. Um, hopefully I can answer that in, in some later slides, but thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, there are, there are trade-offs in terms of other types of, some things are less programmable or more programmable or whatever the case may be. So I'll get to that in a, in a hot second. Cool. So um, getting into how you evaluate investing in a, a crypto protocol or, or token, um, outside of angel investing. So this is what I love about uh, crypto is everything is, is out in the open. Um, <laughs> it's kind of crazy how much information exists. Whereas if you're angel investing in a pre-seed company, um, you can't have access to their, to their data. You can't have access to you know, their user base. If it's a crypto company, everything's on a blockchain and you can you can download everything yourself. So this is the process that I like to do if I'm thinking about investing in a particular crypto protocol or particular crypto token. First, I find out who the team is because, you know, as much as uh, this, this stuff is software, there are human beings building this stuff behind the scenes. Even Satoshi, him or herself or themselves said, I'm not this mysterious figure. I'm just a person who is building software. So you can listen to the podcast that they're on. Just search their name into Spotify or Apple Podcasts. You can read their writing on Medium. You can check out their Twitter. Um, you can play around with their product because uh, while there are some pre-product crypto protocols and tokens, a lot of them are, are live and you can you know, plug in and download the node and run it yourself. Um, it, is the product good? Compare it to other things. If it's a stable coin, does it you know, work as well as other stable coins. You can see if they have traction. So this is the awesome thing. You can see um, how many people are, you know, accessing or um, using smart contracts on their platform. Do they have community? So this is a huge thing. Um, I think we've all seen with Wall Street Bets and Doge, the power of, of community at scale. Um, are people on, uh, on their Twitter, on their Discord, on their Telegram channel, excited about the project and evangelizing it to their friends. Developer ecosystem, if applicable, uh, I'm sure you've all seen the Steve Ballmer thing at the Microsoft conference where he's like, developers, 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 developers. Uh, this is one of the, the keys, I think, for um, anything that's, that's programmable and wants people to have experiences and apps on top of their on top of their protocol, how many developers and are, are actively building on it? And how is the, the ecosystem, the documentation, um, responsiveness to the dev community, all that stuff that you would apply to any sort of other software platform. Um, and then finally, this is a little bit specific to crypto, but the risks, is it fully decentralized like say Bitcoin or is it, pretty close to centralized, like say a Ripple. Um, if it's decentralized, you can't haul Satoshi Nakamoto in front of Congress and grill him like you can Mark Zuckerberg or, uh, you know, Jack Dorsey. Um, there are um, very few crypto tokens that have reached the point of so centralized that the SEC is, uh, is really investigating them sharply. I don't want to hate on Ripple, but that's one of them. Um, and then finally, is it something that's relying on another right. protocol? So if you're building on top of Bitcoin, that protocol isn't going offline anytime soon. And no one's going to come in and say like, this is like, sorry, you can't build on this. Um, if you're building on top of uh, Ripple, 
and Ripple gets the plug pulled by the SEC, then your business is, or your token is pretty much screwed. Um, so I think uh, there are two questions from the audience so far. Um, sorry to interrupt you, but one is sure. from uh, Sam Saliba. Uh, okay. Sam, oh. I'll let him do the talking. <laughs> oh, all right, live, live uh, question. Hey Sick Dave. Profile pic, Sam. Uh, the, the old the, cell phone. All, all business, all the time. Yeah. Um, th thanks for presenting. Just quick question on how we should be thinking about timelines when it comes to crypto companies, um, particularly uh, before a liquidity event. So like if a typical seed investment is six to 10 years, what, like what, what do you like, what's the model for crypto? Um, so I, I think, and this, this came up in, I, I've given this presentation before to a different set of angel investors. The broader um, question is maybe how do you evaluate if you're investing in a traditional software company as an angel investor, you do a safe, you get 0.01% of the company, and then they go public or get bought. And that's your liquidity event. In the instance, uh, generally, in the instance of crypto companies, you could have equity, but then you could have tokens as well. Um, and I, so this was my sort of non-answer from the other, from the other talk as well. I don't know if they're a great set of heuristics because of the ever-changing nature of this space, the regulation, the rapidly ascending technology, uh, the decentralized nature of a lot of these protocols. I don't know if there's a, a sort of playbook for one, should you choose all tokens on one side or all equity on the other side or 50-50 or whatever. Um, I'm in the process of figuring that out. Uh, especially because one, I haven't invested in any companies where I've gotten tokens. I've only gotten equity. Um, and then two, what are the timelines in terms of liquidity? Um, and how do the, how do the founders or the, the communities sort of evaluate that? My sense is that because of the, if there is a token, the liquidity timeline is going to be much shorter because there are going to be people who not necessarily are um, smaller retail investors, but people people want access to liquidity, and you can uh, you can put yourself into the market much sooner and get a get a price signal and a signal as to if your your product is working. So I would say maybe cut it in half, just as a rule of thumb. But you know, don't take my word for it. Do your own research, um, and if you're considering investing a larger sum of money. Um, I, either in a complete token or protocol or an angel investment, like these are the kinds of questions you want to be asking the founders because theoretically they have um, some sort of answer to this. I've seen teams that, that don't, but if they're, that's another signal of like, do I want to invest in this or not? Have they thought about, are we going to provide liquidity to the people who believed in us at the, at the very beginning? Um, and you got a couple more questions. Sorry, sorry yeah. to cut you off. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, another one is from. Ch sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, just to kind of like wrap up this this section. Um, so, really, like tokens are kind of think about it the, the ultimate angel investment. Like, your ninety nine percent of angel investments fail and go to zero. Same is true for for new tokens. Just take a look at. Uh, the top 10 coins from two years ago, four years ago, six years ago, pretty much Bitcoin and Ethereum are the only ones that are still there. Um, it's almost like tokens are almost like um, investing in, in that pre-seed round, but there's liquidity from day one. Um, so they're, they're kind of the ultimate angel investment. Uh, go ahead, Richard. I was going to say that um, it's probably better that we leave all the questions to the end just to make sure that we have. Sure. Uh, yeah, and I only have here. a couple more <laughs> slides and then we can get into uh, broader discussions. So I do want to touch a little bit on um, macro trends and NFTs are really popular right now. So I want to touch on those a little bit. Um, so what is this uh, sea change in terms of, there's not top-down centralized 
you know, power anymore. You don't need permission to make money anymore. Um, you can fractionalize, uh, fractionalize value and send it to anybody in the world. What does this mean? Well, it just means we're just going to push everything into the, into the metaverse. Um, I think before it was pretty much impossible to appropriately capture um, a lot of assets and make them digital, make them software. Um, and because of that, like you just, because it didn't exist online, you had to spend time IRL on, you know, say buying real estate or something of that nature. Um, now we have ways to uh, tokenize everything and create these markets and price discovery. So, okay, now it's going away from IRL and everything's going, going online. Um, okay, now that less things are, you know, IRL, why do you need to be in one place physically? Um, all you need is an internet connection. Um, so expect people to move around uh, more so. Um, and then as more people move around, and I don't know if anyone is aware of the, you know, Miami tech hub boom, um, but there, these municipalities are going to start competing for uh, wealth and talent and crypto wealth and talent. So San Francisco is great. I'm currently in San Francisco. A, a lot of people have issues with it, but you don't need to be in San Francisco anymore to um, be at the epicenter of Silicon Va Valley. All you need is an internet connection or why even stay in America? Um, if you have issues with um, America as a whole, you could, maybe you're very into crypto and things are unfriendly in a regulatory sense in America, you can move to Singapore or Bermuda or wherever, wherever you want. What happens when a, to America when um, a large percent of billionaires move out of America and they no longer have this tax revenue? Um, and then finally, like, there's this shifting of identity where um, traditionally you're like, I'm from, you know, Detroit, I'm from New York, I'm from, I grew up in Berlin after the fall of the, um, you know, Soviet Union, like your physical location is your identity. Um, my sense is there's going to be a shift and you're already seeing this. Um, people are really gravitating towards ideals um, and identities that are um, created and curated almost entirely online. And it, it doesn't really matter where you are physically. Um, and then finally, quick note about NFTs. NFTs are great. Like, I think it's fantastic to see stuff like NBA Top Shots or Beeple or Tom Brady starting an NFT company. Um, it, these things have product market fit. It's the first um, crypto native product market fit product. But this is just the tip of the iceberg and it's just, um, I, I'm long NFTs for sure, but I don't think they're, uh, they should necessarily be dominating the conversation, uh, especially in, in terms of uh, investing in angel companies or investing in tokens or protocols. It's just another slice of the overall ecosystem crypto. Cool. Now we can, now we can get to questions. Cool. Um, with, uh, Chidima, um, uh, unmute yourself and Hi, ask your question. Well, basically her question is, can you define what being decentralized means? Uh, so there, there's no, uh, there is quote unquote fully decentralized and there is um, fully quote unquote centralized, but these things are along a spectrum. Uh, not even Bitcoin is 100% decentralized. What that means is that um, everyone is sovereign in the ecosystem. No other individual can uh, take your personal property. Um, so if you take a look at the Chinese um, system, the government can take whatever they want. Um, similarly in the United States, okay, it's a little less common, but if you piss off the wrong people, they can seize all your assets or um, take away your freedoms. 
Um, they can throw you in jail if they want. Um, that's centralized power. Um, in a decentralized world, um, there are, everyone has access to the same um, power mechanisms and value or power accrues to um, people based on the market and based on uh, information exchange and not, um, not a, a, a sort of like ownership or uh, of, by a small set of people. Um, in a more concrete manner, it basically means that uh, there's no one person in charge, it's everybody is in charge. Got it. Ooh, eight more questions. Let's go. Richard, I don't know if you want to call uh, out the next person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tremaine, um, do you want to ask your question? What counts as a larger sum of money for an angel investment? Uh, large, large in terms of um, crypto or just in general? Yeah, I mean, I think specific to crypto you mean you made a comment earlier about if you're going to be making a larger angel investment i was just wondering what constitutes large sure. in that context yeah this is one of those things um you need to do your own research and i've made maybe 20 angel investments and a lot of it is not the size of the check it's more about the size of the check obviously matters but it's more about the percentage ownership in terms of valuation if you're at a $10,000 check in a company that's uh, being valued at 4 mo million post money, that's way different than writing a $10,000 check that's than a company that's being valued at a billion post money, just because of the, the percentages. Same thing with buying a crypto token. If there are a million tokens and you buy 10,000 tokens, then you own a certain percentage. If you buy 10,000 tokens and there are uh, a billion tokens, you own way less percentage. And you also need to think about, are they gonna issue more tokens? Are they gonna to destroy tokens? Are people gonna like, do people spend tokens so they get like burned? So I like to think about it in terms of percentages rather than, <clears throat> rather than just the, the size of the check. Um, and if you're someone who, obviously the, the quantity, the, the dollar amount matters, uh, if you're 10,000, you're writing a $10,000 check and your net worth is a hundred million. Okay. Like that's one thing, or maybe you live in Montana and you have less U S dollars. Um, you got to think about that as it, you know, affects your, your lifestyle and, um, how you're thinking about, uh, allocation of wealth and sort of what you need to tap into. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Cool. All right. Next question um, from Stephanie. For the end, recommendations for a crypto index fund? Yeah. Um, there is something called DPI, which is a, a DeFi uh, index fund. My sense is that, um, and these are um, tokens. So it's a token of tokens, pretty much, um, which aggregates the top DeFi protocols like Aave and Compound and Curve. And instead of having to constantly like rebalance your portfolio, it'll do it for you. I'm not sure how advanced you are. And if you have like a MetaMask wallet and you feel confident buying this on an exchange, um, but that is the one that I recommend in terms of, uh, I think it has the highest potential upside. Um, there are a couple other indices um, off the top of my head, but in general for um, just the big name tokens, I would just buy Bitcoin and Ethereum um, and hold those. That's kind of like an index of the broader market. Um, if you're getting into DeFi, um, DPI is the, the name of the token. And I would recommend that because I think, I don't know how many people know about DeFi or decentralized finance. Uh, my sense is there's a huge amount of value accrual that's going to flow there over the next couple of years. Um, there's also a few NFT indices. I, I bought, I don't know if you've heard of crypto punks before, but I bought part of an index of all the crypto punks. Um, one coin is like $200,000. So I bought like a very small percentage. Um, 
And there are a few others that I'm sure exist and you can follow up with me and I can point you in the right direction afterwards. Cool, uh, Siva uh, said hello from Singapore. Um, next question is from David. What's the likelihood of government regulation stunting the proliferation of crypto? For example, ban ownership, exchanging crypto. Yeah, um, so there are a couple couple things here. I don't know if anybody knows Avicho Garg. Um, he was former director of product at Facebook, now runs Electric Capital, which is a uh, crypto focused venture firm. So there's a pretty, um, pretty interesting game theoretical set of assumptions here. All right, let's say tomorrow, uh, Joe Biden has a heart attack, Kamala Harris is in a coma and like, you know, somebody comes back and is like, we're banning Bitcoin. Well, where does everything, one, banning things never works. I mean, look at the war on drugs. Like, how, how good was that? I think the Portland mayor tweeted like, I'd like to congratulate drugs for winning the war on drugs. Um, in Turkey, they just banned cryptocurrency and it's like Google interest was like, so that's the first thing. The second thing is in a game theoretic sense, Bitcoin isn't going away because what happens if the U.S. bans it? Then China, Brazil, India, Russia, they start using that as a lever to attract um, talent to people who maybe have less allegiance to America, but are very much inclined to want to um, transact in uh, cryptocurrencies. Could all the nations of the world combine and make it a death penalty to even own cryptocurrency, I guess, but like, come on, the U United States can't even like mail a check to people, let alone like check to see if people's like MetaMask wallets have cryptocurrency in it. Um, the second thing is like, it's too entrenched now. Coinbase is public on the NASDAQ. Like are, if there's one thing politicians love to do, it's they love to enrich themselves and like, they love the stock market going up. Like that's good for the, for the donor class. So like, are they gonna undo the billions of dollars in wealth that was created by Coinbase or like JP Morgan is now offering an investment vehicle. Um, and a lot of these um, municipalities, I, I don't know if you've been following along, like they are writing, again, things are comprised of individual humans. The Miami mayor put the Bitcoin white paper on the official city of Miami's website. Um, there's a municipality in Louisiana that just wrote a proclamation saying, Satoshi Nakamoto is great. We love Bitcoin. Come here and we'll, you know, sponsor your Bitcoin business. Um, America, I feel, is way too decentralized to, to ever ban it. Um, will smaller municipalities ban it? Sure. Will it be effective? It's highly doubtful. Awesome. Uh, next question, uh, again, from Tremaine. Uh, favorite resource besides generally Twitter uh, for staying on top of developments in the space? Yeah, I'm a, I like to listen to stuff, so I love podcasts. Um, there are a few that I recommend. Um, and again, like human, human uh, individuals comprise this ecosystem. So there are a few really smart people who have their own podcasts that I listen to you know, pretty regularly. One is Pomp, Anthony Pompoliano. He was formerly at Facebook, formerly at Snapchat, now runs his own uh, investment firm and has a, has a podcast, P-O-M-P, the Pomp podcast. Um, I like Bankless, Bank, L-E-S-S, -S, for uh, Ethereum-focused things. Um, what Bitcoin did uh, with Peter McCormick is a great podcast exclusively focused on, um, on Bitcoin. He's kind of a Bitcoin maximalist, but he has great people talking about not just Bitcoin, but also the macroeconomic environment, like the bond market, inflation, how all these things kind of tie into Bitcoin becoming this uh, major asset. Um, there are a bunch more and I'm more than happy to, oh, and also Andreessen Horowitz, Anything Andreessen Horowitz puts out is fantastic. Um, more than happy if you have a specific area of interest to point you in the right direction. But 
listen to those episodes, you know, um, listen for the next couple of weeks and you'll feel, it might go over your head a little bit, but you'll start to get in the groove of things. Uh, there's another question from Andy. Um, well, first of all, thanks for doing this, Dave. Thoughts on yeah. the Gary V Ethereum drop on May 5th? Uh, I mean, if you want to speculate, he's a marketer. He knows how to generate hype. I don't doubt. He seems like he's genuine in his um, excitement about um, this space, is it something from an investment vehicle perspective that I'd be like, this is a great vehicle. It's going to appreciate a hundred percent or 200% year over year. Like, I don't know, maybe, um, if you're going to spend money, put it in Bitcoin or Ethereum or the DPI index. Like those are the blue chips. That's the Google, Facebook, Amazon of, of crypto, in my opinion. Awesome. Uh, another question from Stephanie. Uh, are there resources to learn for those of us who are non-engineer novices? I can grasp the concept, but it helps to consume info in business language. Yeah. Um, the cool thing about crypto is that it's um, at the intersection of so many different disciplines. So uh, specifically the What Bitcoin Did podcast, the dude who runs it, Peter McCormick, is I can guarantee you less technical than everybody on this call. Um, he's, he's a media guy. Um, so he has, he produces like podcasts and stuff. Um, that's a, that's a great resource. Um, Nick Carter, N I C Carter, um, comes from a finance background. So he, he worked at Fidelity in terms of investments, runs his own, um, crypto venture firm. Now, um, I, I'm not, I'm not tech. I'm going to just say I'm not technical. Like I have written some like SQL and like some Python, but you know, I'm not an engineer or anything like that. Um, so it's not, um, you don't need to be anywhere near an engineer to get really high quality content. And I often find the best content is, um, not, <laughs> not engineering focused because this is more of a economic game, theoretical, sociological, uh, financial type of technology versus a pure software play. Oh, and anything Balaji writes, Balaji Srinivasavan. Um, I don't know if anybody knows him here. Um, and I can also uh, send out a list to all my favorite resources after this. So you don't need to scribble everything down immediately. There's a question from Siva. Any recommendations for those who want to move to crypto slash blockchain companies, any resources, jobs, portals to follow? Yes. Um, so there, I have some specific resources and then I also have, um, I, it's kind of interesting because almost every, and it depends on the company. Is it something like you want to move to JP Morgan because they have a crypto division now, or are you trying to join a three person startup that's building an exchange or something like that. Um, there is something called proof of talent uh, run by this guy named Crypto Bobby, <laughs> Rob Paoni. Um, his entire um, focus is on just um, connecting smart people, awesome people with crypto companies. Um, I also um, know a bunch of crypto companies that are hiring. so. I don't know your background um, or what you're interested in, but you can DM me offline. Um, so th there are resources and I think there's, I'm trying to remember if there's another, oh, Pomp actually launched a job board. So Anthony Pompliano, former Facebook guy, just launched a crypto job board as well. So yes, those are the resources and also just DM me. Cool. One more question from Javier. Other than uh, BTC, uh, well, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and DPI, what's your favorite crypto investment with a five to 10 year uh, horizon? <laughs> um, I don't, I, I like MakerDAO. 
Um, here's the thing, all these things don't have like product market fit yet. So they're cool ideas, but they could just be too early. Similar to all the things like um, Airbnb, someone tried to start Airbnb in 2001, but it's just too early. Or you couldn't do Uber in 2003 because smartphones didn't exist yet. So I like the ideas behind MakerDAO. Uh, I like the ideas be behind um, Atom um, and Cosmos. Um, there are a few, uh, few other ones. Um, Foam, F-O-A-M, um, is a cool one. And that's like decentralizing GPS data. That's pretty awesome. Um, the graph is something that I haven't invested in, but seems really interesting. It's kind of like um, we're basically structuring all the information on, on all blockchains to query it, sort of like this huge database of information. Um, I've mostly been focused on stuff built on top of Ethereum and Bitcoin, um, but those are the other, other ones that I have um, investments in. And then like specific ones in the DPI index, like Aave, Compound, Curve, those are all pretty awesome as well. And Kyber Network too. Cool. Uh, another question from Chidima. Who can start a Bitcoin company and how do you tie to an interest such as uh, social just justice or fashion into a crypto? Yeah, um, so that's the cool thing about starting a Bitcoin company. Anyone can plug into the network. You just have to build some software and run it on top of the, the existing blockchain. Um, how you can um, integrate social justice or fashion, I think it, some of the strongest incentives, and this is the thing that I think is, is really cool about blockchain and cryptocurrency technologies, um, there's, it gets rid of the middlemen. So you're doing page, let's say you're doing Patreon right now, they need, uh, they're the middleman to connect. I'm running a, a homeless shelter to the person who wants to um, donate to it and they take a 10% fee or whatever it is. Um, that, that really uh, gets disintermediated and you can just connect directly with people um, for extremely minimal processing fees. So that's one thing. Um, just connecting people and cutting out the middleman. The second thing is um, there's there's a way to, um, and, and this is something that I think will be really cool eventually, um, the logistics of, of atoms as opposed to bits will eventually be coordinated on the blockchain. So um, getting a little more concrete, uh, Amazon right now is basically solving logistics problems of moving atoms, moving matter, moving things. Um, but they're a centralized company and they don't have all of the information that exists all, in the, all over the world of like, maybe plastics are a little bit cheaper here, or maybe uh, this person, this labor is somewhat cheaper or higher quality over here. All of that information, including the price uh, in, a, in a broad market of all the information that exists will eventually be on the blockchain. And there will be software that exists to route the value and source everything uh, like in the material atom-based world um, at some point. Will that be in five years? Probably not, probably more like 10 years. Um, but eventually that will be whoever saw basically like the flex port, um, but for, um, if you guys know what Flexport is for, uh, but using crypto primitives. Um, that, is, that is longer, much farther down, down the line, but in the short term, um, you can hire people to plug into the, the Bitcoin or any blockchain and cut out the middleman, save that 10% fee or whatever. Cool, there's a question from Jeffrey. What is the hype around investing in Bitcoin mining capacity? Is it worth it? Uh, what return rates are folks out there actually? Yeah, um, so it depends. Um, and my friend, uh, Jeremiah, who's also ex-Facebook, he actually invested in a, like a pretty big Bitcoin mining, not 
as big as the ones in the dams in China or whatever, but he has a plot of land. Um, it's a, a calculation based on a few things. One is how cheap is the electricity that you can get? Um, the second thing is, um, do you think the price of Bitcoin <laughs> is going to go up? Is it going to appreciate? Um, and the third thing is the, the hardware that, that you can get, um, the, the specific mining hardware. Um, are you doing it just on a GPU or are you using like specific Bitcoin mining hardware? Um, I, you know, I, I basically have run the numbers on, um, I have a little coin, it's called coin mine and it's about like that big and you just plug it into the wall just because I was interested in doing it. Um, I've made money, not a lot. I made like 50 or hundred bucks. Um, but because, because of the price appreciation, I have made it, I, that has gone up. If the price were to remain flat from where I started when it was at 10,000, probably would have broken even. So um, if you are interested in that, run the numbers. I can put you in contact with my friend, Jeremiah Rogers, um, who has a lot more experience than I do. Uh, if you want, I'll see if he's open to it. But it's, it's kind of a bet on Bitcoin's future um, from an alternative sort of like direct to the source, really getting it out of the ground, if you will. Awesome. Uh, another question from Javier. Do you see a future with many L1 chains or if you're wins? I, I'm coming, I thought for a while. So just to give some context on this, um, there are multiple layers of technology that comprise um, one money and two uh, like, like blockchains. Um, so they're different. Visa is not the lowest layer of money. Um, the, there's like a federal like reserve system that basically finalizes all payments. So when you're paying for coffee with your Visa card in the morning, um, that's not actually like a finalized settled transaction where you can't like send it back. That takes weeks or months, um, depending. Um, so when we talk about layer zero, layer one, layer two, it's just like stacks of technology on top of each other, similar to how there's like TCP IP. And then you have like stacks of, in, of technology on top of that for the internet. So, uh, to answer your question, um, I originally thought it would just be everything would be built on Ethereum, but I'm coming around to the conclusion that like there's going to be probably a specific blockchain for the major use cases just because Ethereum, and it's, again, like it's trade-offs in terms of, uh, I forget who asked the question, the first question at the very beginning, different uh, blockchains have made different trade-offs in terms of the blockchain that powers NBA top shots is much more centralized. So they can move a lot more quickly than the Bitcoin completely, de almost completely decentralized blockchain, which moves incredibly slowly in terms of uh, changing or making upgrades, but that's on purpose. Um, so for uh, all the new applications that are going to be built on blockchains, there might be Solana or Binance chain or Ethereum or some, you know, Bitcoin chain or whatever. Um, it, it strikes me as like um, these things, just because there are so many um, different flavors to what people want to do with these on the internet and just in life. Some people might be like, I don't care. Like, give me the U.S. federal government blockchain. Like, I don't care about centralized money or like the Chinese RMB blockchain. Um, other people might be like, no, my privacy, Bitcoin only. Um, so I think there'll probably be a dozen or two dozen different blockchains. Cool. And last question from Sam Saliba. Can you share the pitch on your rolling fund? Sure. Um, so it's not just crypto focused. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for asking that. Um, I'm honing in the thesis, but um, essentially we are in a technology super cycle where 
we built the base layer of infrastructure of the internet where we're, we've connected everything. And that, that created this, this curve and we're at a, a maturity for like web 2.0 or whatever. Now with these, uh, not just cryptographic primitives, but also the maturation of ML and AI, um, the applicability of engineering to the, the genomic space and the base layer of uh, the demographics of the world uh, coming online and, and changing. More than a billion people have been born since 2010. Um, the world is going to experience a um, technological super cycle in which things will be much, much different than uh, in 10 years. I would say even more so than they were from 2010 to 2020 or from 2000 to 2010, like 10 X or hundred X difference. So my fund is looking at what are the companies that are uh, driving this change to speed along the technology super cycle, either by building the uh, infrastructural components of like, we are creating a way like DevOps tools for CRISPR engineering or they're riding the wave of uh, ML and AI are, you know, a commodity now, like how do we, um, how do we build on top of that and get it in the hands of every single, every single person. Um, so not crypto exclusive, but um, will be, that's one of the, the things that I think has a chance to a thousand X or 10,000 X. And it's a, it, in addition, companies that aren't taking advantage of, the other, of these other things, like, um, like heavily into cryptographic primitives. Um, I, I just don't think stand a chance against fully decentralized like markets and protocols. Cool, it seems that that's all the questions from the audience. Um, please join us in a uh, Slack channel. <laughs> Um, we have a channel called uh, blockchain um, hyphen crypt, uh, crypto. Uh, that's where Dave will be and uh, we can uh, talk some more over there. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Bye.